Chancellor's Office, I'd like to welcome everybody to this morning's uh, Director's Colloquium. Uh, Peter Littlewood unfortunately can't be here. He's traveling back from Washington today, but uh, he's well vested in this area and very passionate about it. In fact, when we talked about um, uh, innovation with the, um, the uh, Secretary of Energy's Advisory Board just a couple of weeks ago, uh, there was a good give and take, and uh, basically the Secretary of Energy said, try some new experiments, see what works, and, and tell us what the, what the best options are. Right? So the DOE is uh, interested in taking the science and technology that we develop here, not just at this laboratory, but at all the national laboratories, and, and getting it to the marketplace if that's possible. Okay. Uh, it's an important task, I submit, but one that's particularly challenging, and there's no specific roadmap yet that's been developed that's universally accepted and followed, and so that's one of the challenges. Uh, here at Argonne, we've done a lot to strengthen this particular area. We've rebooted our uh, technology transfer division. We now call it uh, uh, technology development and commercialization, and so that's definitely relevant to today's talk. Uh, we're obviously fortunate to be located uh, near Chicago, right? which is a, a, a very active hub. Uh, many investors, venture capitalists, entrepreneurs uh, that we have the opportunity to, to interact with. Okay? Uh, the laboratory is also working on forging stronger relationships with the city of Chicago and the Chicago Research Universities, including our own University of Chicago and the other non-governmental agencies that are down there. Uh, this is the kind of uh, collaboration that uh, our speaker, John Flavin, specializes in. Uh, so I'm particularly interested, and I hope you are too, to hear what he's got to say about the opportunity space that we're living in. Uh, John is the executive director, as you can see, of the, something called the Chicago Innovation Exchange, and we're going to hear more about that this morning. It's a hub based downtown at the University of Chicago, and a couple of weeks ago, a number of us had an opportunity to tour the space. Uh, it's space that can uh, engender, uh, help uh, multidisciplinary uh, collaborations and uh, support, provide support for business startups. Uh, John is an entrepreneur with uh, over 20 years of experience. Before heading the Chicago Innovation Exchange, he led something called the Chicago Innovation Mentors, a consortium that included Oregon National Laboratory with the goal of commercializing uh, new technology and supporting entrepreneurship. Uh, in the area. Uh, he's led two successful NASDAQ uh, uh, IPOs, and he's raised over $220 million and growing, right, uh, in public and private capital and co-founded several companies, including uh, Advanced Life Sciences, Medichem Life Sciences, and Matter, a biosciences innovation center in downtown Chicago, and uh, Flavin Ventures, a uh, venture capital creation and management firm. He also sits on the board of the Illinois Science and Technology Coalition. How about a warm welcome for John Flavin to our Colloquium. Thank you, Al. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. I'm very excited to talk to you about the emerging innovation landscape in Chicago. And to set the stage for this, um, what I'd like to do is uh, put this in a context of how Chicago, like other global cities in America, are responding to a crisis. And uh, in that response, innovation is emerging and accelerating. And amongst that backdrop, I will talk about Chicago itself, the emerging landscape, the different assets and innovations that we have, and what that portends uh, for our future economy. Uh, from a robustness and diversity perspective and where we're headed. Um, but before I do that, I'd like to walk with you, if you will, um, in my own journey as an entrepreneur uh, in Chicago and some of the challenges that entrepreneurs face, but what the opportunities that go along with that. The ups and downs in the process, like science, bringing a, a new novel idea to the marketplace. Entrepreneurship is its own science and uh, sets of experiments, some that work, some that don't. Uh, over a long period of time. A lot of the elements of success as a scientist uh, are the same types of features that entrepreneurs have to have. You know, patience, the ability to be obsessed with an idea and bring it forward over a long period of time. And so um, what I'd like to do is first set the stage for 
uh, this, this discussion. If you think about Chicago, uh, it was founded by entrepreneurs, innovators. I mean, the great companies and corporations and universities that we have today in Chicago uh, were uh, led and started uh, largely after the Great Chicago Fire. I mean, it was a response to a crisis from which the Chicago that we know today emerged. And what is that Chicago? It's made up of uh, a great diverse economy that over many centuries uh, has been built with a strong fabric and a diversified set of resources and an economic engine uh, that has allowed us to enjoy the quality of life that we have here in Chicago over many, many years. Um, but it's important to remember that it wasn't always that way. It didn't start looking like this. Uh, it started um, rising from the ashes. Uh, and it was creativity. It was risk-taking. It was uh, dealing with a lot of obstacles in getting to the point where over many, many years, Chicago became what it's become. Um, if you look from a high-level perspective, Chicago looks to be intact, and in many respects it is. But it's under assault, like other great American cities. Uh, to be competing on a global scale, Chicago needs to be continually reinventing itself as it thinks about the next 20, 30, 50 years. And reliance on any one industry, relying, reliance on any one size of corporation, resting on your laurels, those kinds of things um, are issues that Chicago, like other national global cities need to deal with, uh, have to examine. Now, in Chicago's case, we're very fortunate in that we have uh, a great smattering of different industries that, we, um, that we're innovative within and that we uh, are able to have uh, jobs and opportunities uh, across a diverse array of industries. Some cities were, were, were not built that way, right? I mean, Detroit and uh, other, other cities around the country that were very reliant on one industry. Chicago, thankfully, has been very diversified. But like those other cities, those large corporations are at risk, and innovation is at the core of why they're at risk. And it's not only innovation that happens here in the United States, but it's innovation that happens around the world now, right? So to be competitive on a global scale, Chicago needs to reinvent itself, and it has all the assets and raw materials to be able to do it. If you look at the timeline, uh, the crisis that I'm describing, the new 1871, if you will, began in 2008. 2008 was a time frame when we uh, really entered the heart of the Great Recession. And I argue that the Great Recession changed America forever, and it changed our up-and-coming generation of new students who will then become scientists of the future, professionals of the future, business people of the future. And at the heart of what the way that America is responding and that Chicago can respond is with the American fighting spirit, and that is with this assault. So when you think about the crisis at that time frame, and I would argue that we're still in that crisis, we're still reinventing ourselves, we're still responding to it. What happened in that time frame? We had the capital markets turning upside down um, we had the liquidity crisis. Um, we had unprecedented events that were happening here in the United States that led to, in many respects, job losses, large, massive layoffs, and um, changes to the way people thought about the future. You know, I know when I was growing up and thinking about my future, um, you know, I was always looking at my mentor, my hero, my dad. You know, he worked for 35 years in Inland Steel. And that was common, you know, to work at one place for a long period of time and you would innovate and, and iterate uh, over the course of your career, but you were generally in, in one place. And I think more so in the Midwest than you see in the, in the coastal regions, which were a little bit more uh, agile when they think about, you know, how they built their industries. You know, maybe flipping forward for a minute, when you think about other innovation cities that roll off the tongue, like Silicon Valley and, and Cambridge, Massachusetts, they responded to crises too, right? I mean, they weren't always what they are today. I mean, Kendall Square in Cambridge... Uh, was, uh, was left vacant by the, uh, you know, closing down of the defense industry after, after uh, World War II. But the response there was a reemergence uh, of entrepreneurship that has made, you know, Cambridge an epicenter for um, technology, you know, pharmaceuticals, biotech, and other activities that have allowed them to become the, the engine of uh, new venture creation that, that they've become, and sustain themselves well into the future. 
So we're in that same situation. We have all those same ingredients here in Chicago. Great universities, great national labs, uh, a good corporate uh, sector. Um, we have uh, a great pace of talent. We have capital here. It's not all oriented toward the startup ecosystem, though. I would say that, again, just like in my path, looking toward the future, training myself for a long career at one place, a lot of my colleagues and peers at my age level were expecting that before the recession hit. When the recession hit, our next generation of um, leaders were affected and changed forever. They said to themselves, you know, I'm watching my dad, I'm watching, you know, my mom, who thought they had a future ahead of themselves in one organization, and now they're laid off, and what do they do next? I don't want to be in that situation, so when I go to school, uh, I want to empower myself to be an entrepreneur. And everybody has a different definition of what an entrepreneur is, but I think what it means to people right now is the ability to feel empowered, whether you work for a large company, small company, large lab, small lab, the ability to kind of have a Swiss Army knife, that if the Great Recession hits again, I know what to do next. I know where to take myself in the future. I feel like I can do something about it. And as a result, you see uh, a surge, almost a euphoria, around entrepreneurship and innovation. You know, if you look at the Booth School of Business, so um, you know, look closer to home, University of Chicago. Back in 1998, Steve Kaplan started up the entrepreneurship program in Booth. Uh, it was renamed the Polsky Center of Entrepreneurship and Innovation in 2002. Uh, fast forward to today, the second highest concentration behind finance in the Booth School of Business, the number one business school in the country, is entrepreneurship. That's a big change. That's a big shift from where you know, those professionals were gearing themselves for the future. When uh, people in my generation were going through the Booth School, they were thinking about going to work for Goldman Sachs or McKinsey or other large organizations. Today, they may choose that path, but those students want to move down a path where they've been trained to be able to do anything from an entrepreneurial perspective. So uh, the, the same thing that, that happened in terms of people's outlook and how it changed our next generation in their vision for the future uh, and being empowered and wanting to undertake entrepreneurship, at least in name. Um, you had also the capital crisis that placed a major impact upon how you bring new technologies forward into the future. So, you know, in 2008, the venture capital industry was crushed. So the way you used to bring new technologies to market was to form a business, license the technology, go out and raise you know, Series A, Series B, and then go public. And that model changed dramatically after 2008, and it's still broken. So Chicago, like other American cities, are responding to a crisis. There's a tremendous opportunity within that crisis to retool ourselves for the next 20, 30, 50 years. And Chicago has all the right assets to be able to, to do this. Um, the ingredients to success in an innovation landscape and a culture is steady flow of innovative ideas, talent, access to diverse types of talent, space, capital, service providers, law firms, accounting firms, clinical research organization, contract manufacturing organizations, exposure to the market, constantly understanding why the market needs what you're doing. Those are ingredients for innovation. I define innovation as being bringing an, an invention to the masses. So good science is about discovering and developing new technologies. Good innovation is taking that good science and being able to practice it on a massive scale. And to be able to do that, exposure to the market, the, the, the patients, the consumers, the buyers of that product, Having exposure to that, where you're doing innovation, is really critical. We have that in Chicago. Gray hair. Um, gray hair is you know, defined as people that have done it before. You know, in an ecosystem that you're trying to build something new, you need people that have been through the process before, perhaps in other parts of the country, perhaps here in Chicago. And then density and critical mass are critical in an ecosystem. If you look at a lot of the, again, better known innovation clusters around the country, you look at downtown Palo Alto, you look at Cambridge Mass, you know, Research Triangle Park, they're dense communities. So when you go to Starbucks on University Avenue in Palo Alto, you're bumping into people that are talking about the same things that you're talking about, uh, intellectual property, you almost kind of got to talk in hushed tones, but you can hear somebody at the next table um, 
talking about their Series A round or a venture capitalist that they think is a, is a jerk or whatever the case might be. And uh, you're interacting and mingling with those people on a social basis because the density and concentration is all in one spot. I would argue this has been a challenge for Chicago. Again, what I'm describing to you are not new concepts. I mean, you know all this. You know that all these great things are attributes to the city. But many have asked the question over time, well, why hasn't Chicago risen to the level of what we believe its full potential to be as an innovation city like a Boston or a uh, Silicon Valley? And I think one of the answers to that question is, is density and critical mass. We're very fortunate that we have this diversity across different industries, and we're very spread out, so we're not as condensed. I do think that there are pockets of density emerging within the city, downtown, Hyde Park, and I'll make my case for that in a, in a few minutes, um, out in the suburbs as well as up north. And those pockets of density all offer different pieces of the innovation ecosystem that uh, start to aggregate. So now the Starbucks within those communities start to bring people of like-minded ideas together and uh, serendipity begins to occur and you start seeing some of these things start to happen. Um, so let me walk you through just briefly kind of what my journey as an entrepreneur looked like and I want to then transpose my experience as an entrepreneur and come back to why I think there's never been a better time to be an innovator and an entrepreneur than today in Chicago because of the way the ecosystem has developed over time. But I think walking in my shoes, you'll have a better understanding of um, the, the life of the entrepreneur, the lonely walk that you walk, and the challenges that you face. And if you're in a community, if you're in an ecosystem, if you're supported by others, uh, you are much more likely to be successful in moving your idea downstream, which would benefit all, right? You're creating jobs, you have products that benefit people, you're creating wealth. I mean, I'm assuming that everybody buys into the thesis that in creating a new enterprise that has a great technology, uh, your good things are going to happen if you can bring that technology to the marketplace, uh, like we've seen over and over and over again in the United States in terms of what has continued to allow our cycles. If you look at the stock market, you know, the trends, and yes, there's downtimes, but there's uptimes, and every uptime gets uh, higher than the, than the last. And, and that's because we're always innovating. We're always creating. We're always bringing something new to the marketplace that the rest of the world needs to get access to. And the crisis, I think, to some degree, has, asked, has pushed and challenged everyone, what is that for us in the next 20, 30, 50 years? Where is that? We have all the seeds of great ideas and great technologies, but everybody's woken up to the fact that, what can I do to bring this idea forward in the marketplace? And that was kind of the thing that I was motivated by as an entrepreneur. So uh, we started our first company. This is uh, myself uh, and my brother, Mike. So I have a business background. Mike has a PhD in medicinal chemistry. And we started our first company in the Chicago Technology Park, an incubator on UIC's campus. I think that's a gremlin there. Uh, I don't know if you, everybody ever, maybe not, but uh, remember those cars? Um, Chicago Technology Park uh, had just opened at that time. It was the first incubator of its kind. Uh, it was designed to try to um, seed the landscape of Chicago with uh, companies in the life sciences arena, and, and we, were, we were one of those. So we rented our first 400-square-foot laboratory there because we needed to access laboratories, and we didn't have a lot of money to, to start with. Um, so it was a PhD, an MBA, and an incubator. And from that, we did a lot of things. We faced a lot of challenges, created a lot of opportunities for others, made money for a lot of people, brought some concepts, some ideas to the marketplace. Some made it, some didn't. Some succeeded in a big way. Some failed in a miserable way. Made some great friends on the journey, but there's some people that don't like us either. And that's, that's part of the life of, of bringing what you believe to be an important concept to the world, whether it's in science or a, or a company or any kind of concept that you're trying to move forward with. There's always going to be these obstacles that you're going to face as you move forward. But we were fortunate. As we grew, we were able to get to the market, and we determined that people liked what we did. They paid us to do it. We hired more people. And, you know, as we hired more people, we needed more space. So we built a larger building. 
you know, over the course of time from the PhD, the MBA, and the incubator, we created a lot of jobs. We brought a lot of new products to the marketplace. We hired a lot of contractors. We paid a lot of attorneys. We paid a lot of accountants all down this journey to try to get, you know, our ideas to the market. I will say that one of the key ingredients to getting an idea to the marketplace, and again, if it is the entrepreneur or the innovator that's bringing you along that path, being obsessed is critical. So being obsessed with why are you doing this in the first place is critical because I got to tell you, about 90% of getting that idea to the marketplace is either a pain in the ass or it's just boring. It's only 10% that really are those joyous upside days that you got to hang around for, you got to survive to do to be able to win in, in those time frames. And so in our case, we were obsessed with bringing medicines to the marketplace. We felt like even if we failed, we would be working on a quest that would help people at the end of the day. And that doesn't have to be everyone's obsession, but you'd have to have an obsession if you're an innovator and an entrepreneur that wants to see your idea through to the marketplace. There's no question about that, and it can't be a hobby. And these are important context uh, points that I'm trying to make here because as we think about building the Chicago Innovation Exchange and building this ecosystem in Chicago, these are important lessons learned along the path that we'll want to make sure we inculcate in new innovators and new entrepreneurs that are trying to bring their ideas forward to the marketplace. And as you'll hear in a few minutes, and as you probably are aware, commercializing ideas are becoming more attractive to individuals that ordinarily may have been thinking about you know, government grant funding, um, with those dollars at risk, thinking about commercialization is becoming a more important option for individuals that in the past may have thought more about, you know, just, just uh, focusing on, on research and then flipping it over the wall and trying to, trying to get that idea into the world. It doesn't work that way anymore. So what we're learning through this process uh, and what I'm trying to talk about is, um, the life and the journey of the entrepreneur has many uh, upside days. Uh, you know, the great day of NASDAQ, uh, that was hard. I mean, it was really hard. I mean, the day is getting to the point. We had 100 meetings in 16 cities to get to the point where we actually got listed on NASDAQ. And I thought we finally did it. I was a, that was an, an, an obsession of mine, too. So Mike wanted to get the drug to the market. I wanted to build a business, and I always wanted to go public. And so I finally got my wish. But going public... Uh, and getting public was uh, a huge, it's like climbing Mount Everest. But what you don't realize is the very next day, you're back to base camp one and starting to climb a new mountain. That's also about entrepreneurship. It doesn't have to be about the IPL, but in my case, that was my Everest. And I found that getting to the top of Everest doesn't mean that you're done. You're just getting started with a whole new set of people with different sets of expectations and a brand new journey. And so you better be ready to chart the next roadmap uh, while everybody's watching what you do. And, you know, uh, again, for all those, uh, the 10% the, the time of those, those great days, which I'm trying to argue are worth it. It's worth fighting for those days because great things happen on those days that transform an economy, that, that change a city, that change a country. It's worth it. It's worth all those sacrifices. As you hear me talk about some of the pains and struggles you also need to know that I wouldn't change it for anything. All those pains and struggles created things. And in those creations, even today, the people we employed over many years are now tooled to build companies, to uh, uh, bring ideas to the marketplace, to raise capital, whatever the case might be. You know, over the course of building uh, our companies, uh, we employed probably six, 700 uh, people, PhDs, MS level, BS level scientists, professionals, that are all out in the world now building businesses, bringing products to the marketplace. And so it's worth fighting for those, it's worth the 90% to get to the 10% great days, even though you have days like this. So our second company, Advanced Life Sciences, did the same thing. We took the company public, we built the business, we brought an antibiotic all the way through clinical trials. Uh, prior to our uh, advisory committee meeting with the FDA, a drug in the same clini clinical class launched by Sanofi Aventis killed a few patients. And so when our drug came up for approval, um, it didn't get approved. 
And, you know, 10 years of work, you know, all the capital that went into it, going public and all those things, uh, you know, if you look uh, on the face here, uh, these were the advisors that were, that were essentially in light of this prior drug that clouded the landscape for antibiotic uh, approvals. Uh, they said no. They said no. And that was, that was a crushing outcome for a company that uh, was focused around bringing this important new medicine to the marketplace. Now, again, one could say, oh, my God, all the, after all that work, this was your reward, you know, that they said no, even though this, by all other accounts, should be a drug that's on the market helping patients with drug-resistant pneumonia. And the answer is, it was still worth it. It was still worth it because there are companies today that followed our lead, that we communicated, that we helped underst them understand. There's a whole new crop of companies that are now solving the antibiotic resistance crisis that we face here in this country. So sometimes you're building layers of sediment for the next group of people to come, and that's part of the ecosystem as well. So an ecosystem is important to the individuals like me as an entrepreneur uh, because you have the support network like you have in these other innovation cities that I've described. And it's a repeater process. It's a machinery mentality. And so building le levels of sediment through the experience process, the success and failure process, is all part of the collective contribution to building an ecosystem that over time can benefit the individuals, whether it's an individual institution, a laboratory, an academic institution, a company, or an individual entrepreneur. It's still worth it, and it's still a work in process. Now look at today. Now this is a messy slide. I'm not going to go through each bubble, but I think what I want to try to paint uh, on this picture is to... Uh, elaborate more fully on where we sit today. Today, Chicago is building a very busy fabric of innovation pieces. You know, at the core, uh, what makes up the innovation ecosystem? It's universities, federal labs, you need incubation, capital, and networks. Um, I'll talk a lot about the Chicago Innovation Exchange in just a minute, uh, but there are a lot of things happening. Uh, you look at 1871, which is in the Merchandise Mart downtown, very focused on digital tech. That's been a great thing for the city because it's caught the attention of policymakers, so Mayor Emanuel, Governor Quinn, as they look at rebuilding and retrenching the economy for the future. 1871 finally helped make entrepreneurship a more acceptable profession in Chicago, you know, one that people were becoming more familiar with. Again, contrast that to downtown Palo Alto, where everybody's an entrepreneur. Their dad is, their mom is, and their cousins, and so on and so forth are all entrepreneurs. Not so much in Chicago because of that dynamic I mentioned, you know, how we were all trained, how our culture was all developed, aiming toward the larger enterprise. But that's changing because of what I mentioned in terms of the Great Recession that's catalyzing a new generation to move forward. But we have to have an ecosystem that supports that. So uh, 1871 has been a great... Um, it's cast a positive spotlight around entrepreneurship and what it means for bringing the city forward uh, into the future to continue to regenerate uh, jobs and technology of the future that continue to make Chicago and America competitive. So for this healthy ecosystem, we've got industry, right? Uh, and it's in manufacturing, it's in IT, it's in biotech, it's in energy. Um, we have uh, great institutions uh, outside the national labs, including Fermi and Argonne, uh, we have University of Chicago, DePaul, Northwestern, Northern Illinois, uh, you name it. You know, we're, we're rich in terms of innovation assets at the early stage. We now have mentoring organizations, whether it be Chicago Innovation Mentors for the Hard Sciences or other mentoring organizations like ITA or, or Propel that focus on uh, the gray hair, the gray hair that can sit around the table and advise an entrepreneur who's beginning to walk on this journey for the first time. Beginning to see some capital. I mean, Chicago's a financial center, but the kind of money that our companies need from a small company innovation perspective is risk money. And as I mentioned, 2008 changed the whole model for how you fund those technologies into the future. In Chicago, we have a chance to be given that capital source to reorient how you finance these businesses moving forward. And I would argue today, getting an idea from uh, origin to the marketplace 
is not a marathon anymore. You know, I, I know when we started Medicam, we did Advanced Life Sciences, it was all kind of a marathon. You're building a company, you're, you're, you're working over long periods of time to get to your big outcome. And today, it's more of a relay race. It's understanding how to finance different segments of the, of the process and who you're handing off your idea to. So, you know, it could be the, the uh, PI at Argonne uh, uh, handing off the baton to the postdoc who wants to make a career out of the idea that's matching up with an MBA student down at Booth that's sitting in a room with some mentors with gray hair uh, that can uh, have enough clout to bring in a venture capitalist to, to put in some money. So we're training the capital to start to look at these ideas because we're starting to become smarter about how we define those ideas within these areas, within these incubators, which I would argue are the engineers of and the catalyst for bringing these other resources together. So the incubators are the ones that kind of connect to the market, they connect to the capital, they connect to the mentors, but they also connect internally to uh, whoever it is they're serving as the innovators, the faculty, the students, the PIs, the postdocs. And, um, you know, what I've seen in coming into the role, and, you know, not only with this role, but also with Chicago Innovation Mentors, is this uh, very strong appetite by PhDs and postdocs to try to take an idea forward into the marketplace. More and more of those postdocs are not likely to stay in academia or in a lab environment uh, because of government funding shortages. So 10% will stay in academia. It's a big number that's going to need to go to the outside to bring their idea to the market or to find a job for that matter, right? So going back to that earlier point around empowerment, they're taking it on themselves to figure out, well, how do I take this idea that my tenured faculty member has to the marketplace, and can I make a career out of this? We did. John and Mike did. So why can't other people do this? I mean, that's just one small story. But if you go back to why, if you, if you can replicate that in a number of ways and engineer it through an incubator setting, then you have a greater chance to really... Uh, set Chicago apart and be a global destination for innovation and entrepreneurship. Why the rest of the world comes to Chicago just for this feature. It takes time to be in that situation, but I would argue we're well on our way to doing it. Several layers of sediment have been laid over a long period of time, and we're starting to see an acceleration toward this concentration and this mentality, this cultural shift, and this move forward to actually build large, important businesses that when you look at that picture of Chicago... There's a whole new section of brand new buildings that if you look out over the next 20 to 30 years of companies that aren't there today that we're creating based on uh, the fact that, you know, we have these ideas, we have these people, we have this talent, we have this capital, we know how to put it together. So that's the Chicago backdrop. That's a little bit about my journey and my story that sets the stage for why I'm very excited about the Chicago Innovation Exchange. Chicago Innovation Exchange is a 34,000 square foot campus on 53rd Street in Hyde Park. I would argue it's an area of density where you have a lot of like-minded individuals with multidisciplinary backgrounds. On one end of campus, you've got the medical center. On the other, you've got the business school. And in between, you've got a great you know, urban education institute. You've got a computation institute. We've got Argonne, Fermilab, and a ton of different innovation sources that could begin to flow through the Innovation Exchange. Now, we've got a lot of great things associated with starting things, but it's how do we bring those pieces together under one roof to start moving those things into the market? And that's what the role of the Chicago Innovation Exchange will be. I'm particularly excited about the space. This is going to open in October. I welcome anyone to the opening. Uh, looks like we'll be in, uh, opening on October 16th uh, for a ribbon-cutting ceremony. I'd like to see everyone in this room here for that event. Uh, I think it's a fitting place from an optics perspective to have an innovation exchange. You know, a theater, right? In a theater, much like the journey of the entrepreneur, you have to stand up on stage, you have to state your case. Sometimes you've got to work impromptu. Sometimes you're booed by the audience as you try to get your idea out there. But it's also about a spotlight. You know, University of Chicago, Argonne, Chicago itself, I think has a richer history of innovation and entrepreneurship than has been spoken about on the national landscape. 
like the Midwest culture is a little more understated. And so some of these things are not talked about at the level that they are in some of these other so, you know, uh, better known uh, innovation cities around the country. We have a rich history of success. You know, some great things have come out of our collective institutions, as we all know. Uh, but we don't talk a lot about that. But we're changing that. As we continue to try to draw more resources in, it's very important to spotlight where we've come from. Did you know, for example, uh, that of the, for, since 2003, there have been 23 exits of academic and government lab spin-outs in Illinois. 20 of those 23 came out of the University of Chicago and Argonne. That's a big number. Does everybody know that story? Did everybody, I, I don't know that that's known by everyone. I think people look at us and they say, well, they're not, they're not doing a lot of entrepreneurship or, or innovation. We are, we have been. But now in the innovation exchange space, it's fitting that we're in a spotlighted area in a place where you can get a lot of that stuff done and where people are going to know that this is where you need to come, both from the inside and from the outside. Um, this space is going to be large. You know, at capacity, we can host 300 people working at the exchange. Um, this space here uh, will offer working tables for 130 individuals that are working around their business concept. Uh, we're going to have programming, events, outside workshops, key opinion leaders, speakers, Nobel laureates coming to talk about things of importance to this growing community of innovators and entrepreneurs. One of the challenges um, of our innovation sources, and why I would argue that we're still early in our building process, is that we have a wealth and a, and a number of great ideas, great technologies. We also have an increased appetite by students and faculty that are motivated, the market is motivating them to some degree, and internally and what they've experienced is motivating them to innovate and try to bring their product to the world through the vehicle of commercialization. But we have to bring resources together for those individuals, that scientist who's at the top of their field when it comes to the technology, but when it comes to starting a business, they don't know what to do next. Where do I go? There's now a place. There's a place that brings together experience, the market, exposure, mentors, workshops, space. We can incubate 25 companies in the space. Argonne, in particular the Jay Caesar uh, initiative, will have an office in the space. Uh, there's going to be a fabrication lab. So 3D printers, mini mills, laser cutters to support early prototyping work will be part of what we offer entrepreneurs as they get up and going in the space. But you can see it's the beginnings of building a community in a very dense area where there's room for growth, much like you saw in Kendall Square post-World War II. It has all the makings of, of those features. And we have all the pieces of innovation. But this Chicago Innovation Exchange, we go back to that big slide with all those bubbles and the activity happening on the Chicago landscape, can be a leading node on the innovation landscape because of the sources of innovation and the great work that we're doing right now in our laboratories. Um, just very briefly, we wanted to be very deliberate, though, as we thought about the Chicago Innovation Exchange so that we could be very unique. Um, we're one of many emerging nodes within the city. We want to be complementary. Where are we different? How are the things that we're going to stand out with as we think about us as a piece of the overall innovation puzzle in Chicago? So 1871 Digital Tech, UIC has their Enterprise Works, which is more life sciences. Northwestern is developing the garage, which is more software technologies. In our case, I think we're going to concentrate and we'll be very focused around, you know, urban problems, but the underpinnings are from a technology perspective, uh, ranging from computation, data analytics, um, across many different industries, whether it's genomics and healthcare to smart cities, um, and other aspects, you know, machine, machine learning. Um, energy, uh, energy storage will be a core component to what we offer and, you know, could be broadly applicable but certainly geared toward, you know, urban challenges. Um, material sciences and all that goes with water, for example, will be a key 
a differentiator in terms of the kind of companies that we're supporting and incubating in the Innovation Exchange. Life sciences, we're very strong there. We have a great medical center. We've got great innovators within the uh, biological and physical sciences divisions as well. And education. So where 1871 is concentrated around digital tech exclusively, we're broader and we're at the earliest stage. And that's, that's where we're going to concentrate our energies around those different sectors. So in order to get going um, and being thoughtful about how we did this, we've taken a design approach to how we're going to program the space. Space looks very cool. It's you know 100-year-old building. I told you it's you know theater and the space across the street is equally remarkable from an aesthetic perspective. So that's why you come there the first time. But the reason you come back is because of who's there. So entrepreneurs, as I've found in my journey, one of the biggest challenges that we faced was not so much infrastructure because we could find that. It wasn't so much money because it's portable. It was knowledge, you know, people. People that have done it before, people that are doing it with me, some comrades that are facing the same challenges, uh, some service firms that have expertise in, in, in doing what I want to do. You know, we had to figure that all out for ourselves as one individual. So I would argue it probably took us a lot longer to get to points where companies today, by going through this process, will be able to be a lot more nimble and faster at getting to value inflection points and getting their product to the market. So we took a design approach. We brought in an outside firm to look at and do interviews and ethnographies on 42 individuals that are all involved in innovation, some here at Argonne, some at Fermi, some at the University of Chicago, some in the community. And uh, we learned that most ventures lose steam in their early stage uh, before they have a chance to really develop their concept. So our place needs to be uh, thoughtful about that. We charted out, you can see in the backdrop here, we charted out what does it take to get an innovation to the marketplace today within our system. And it's pretty complicated and there's a lot of bottlenecks along the way. So we uncovered some areas where we might be able to optimize to be able to align our resources and reduce the friction once we have the idea, incubating it, supporting it, connecting to the marketplace and getting it there faster. Uh, and making this process that today looks very complicated, uh, making it a lot more streamlined. So for us to achieve our mission, uh, we need to guarantee and support the fact that entrepreneurs and innovators maintain momentum throughout every stage of the commercialization process, the march to the marketplace. And, you know, uh, there's, you don't have to look far, you know, uh, uh, across the traditional model of technology transfer. You know, the, the, the old process is more difficult to achieve today. Um, you know, filing a disclosure, filing a patent, putting the inventory on the website, and trying to ask the market, are you interested in licensing the tech, this technology, doesn't work as successfully as perhaps it once did. Today, you've got to be moving forward. You've got to be generating momentum. And so to, to bring assets to life, the ideas that our scientists have, momentum is key. It's not a portrait anymore. It's not a snapshot. It's a moving picture. So the CIE will help develop that momentum uh, by surrounding the innovator with those resources to keep that momentum moving forward so that they don't end up as a zombie company, as a zombie idea, as a zombie technology that sits on the website being offered to, to license out to the marketplace, but with not really thinking about why would the market need it? You know, what problem is this solving? Who would pay for this? What pain points are out there in the marketplace? Momentum implies that you're connected and that you're moving forward. So to do this, you know, you, we've identified that for us to have a good program and attract those entrepreneurs beyond the space, beyond the coffee shop that we're going to have in there, that's always a great place for serendipity and innovation, as we all know. But in addition to that, having an engineered process, a methodology that makes the CIE unique amongst all incubators around the world uh, is identifying a pathway. So concept growth. Um, you know, innovators need to understand that there's evidence that the idea is developing into a viable business. Process clarity. What are the next steps? What obstacles am I about to face up ahead of me? If I can illuminate that path in the CIE, I'm going to increase my chances that I'm going to be moving down uh, that narrow road to success and commercialization. Career promise. Innovators are excited about bringing their idea to the marketplace, but all of them are kind of being impacted by different things as they consider walking down this journey uh, in moving their idea to the market, and all are motivated. So understanding the innovator and where they are in their career and what they're trying to achieve will help us support them in the intake process of what, what the best thing is for them to be able to, you know, whether they're just starting their career 
they're mid-career or they're tenured, um, there's going to be different reasons why those individuals come to the CIE, and we're going to have different methodologies as to how we support them in realizing their vision. So we've come up with, through this design process, a commercialization process guide. So when you come to the Chicago Innovation Exchange, we've got a roadmap to help you understand how to orient, um, how to build, how to iterate, and how to scale. And we have a team that we've built, uh, and then a network of individuals, corporations that we're partnering with, like with Cisco and J.P. Morgan and venture capital firms that will be in the CIE space as well, that we're going to be able to help you understand what those obstacles are up ahead, provide you resources beyond space uh, to be able to move your idea to the marketplace and make sure that the participants keep moving forward to the marketplace. We also believe that the CIE is a place for exploration. It's a safe harbor. Many just want to learn about entrepreneurship. Many want to learn about whether this is for them. You know? So going to a workshop, hearing someone talk, might help you better understand, is this the right path for you? Um, and in what way is it the right path for you? Because when I use that word entrepreneur, I use it very broadly. And it's really your own definition of what an entrepreneur is. So we have a recipe, we have a path, and we think we're going to be a very strong contributor to making Chicago a global destination for entrepreneurship and innovation. Because the CIE brings together all those things that I mentioned at the forefront uh, that are required for an innovation hub. Steady flow of innovative ideas. Check. We've got that, right? Talent. We've got diversified talent across a range of disciplines. Business, education, law school students. I can't even tell you. You know, law, the dean of the law school is having challenges because the law school students that are part of the program are not really interested in the traditional path to the marketplace. Just like the PhD is not interested in that traditional path for market reasons, the law school students that see working in a big law firm that's changing very dramatically is unattractive. So I want to get involved in a startup. I want to understand how to do startup law, or I want to start my own <laughs> law firm. That's the kind of change that I've referred to when I talk about the Great Recession, how it's impacted our next generation of leaders, but in a multidisciplinary way. And at CIE, we're able to bring all those individuals together, working on common problems, both from an experience perspective and from an experiential learning perspective. I mean, University of Chicago is an academic institution. So we offer opportunities to students. Students are going to be able to come to the University of Chicago to get an education, experiential learning opportunity at the Innovation Exchange. PhD in uh, biochemistry, but a residency as a, a venture associate working for a year at the Innovation Exchange looking at how to invest in small, innovative companies would look good on a resume, um, would maybe push them down a path, that student down a path that they otherwise weren't equipped to, to pursue. Um, you know, capital, we've got the innovation fund, $20 million innovation fund, uh, and that innovation fund is investing in proof of concept work associated with ideas coming out of, the, uh, out of our uh, innovation sources. Um, and then exposure to market, gray hair, got plenty of that in the space. And again, I would argue that on 53rd Street, we've got the density and critical mass. Um, in Hyde Park, 53rd Street is an up-and-coming corridor. Um, 23 new retail have come in. Uh, there's a brand new hotel, Hyatt Park Hotel. It's the first hotel in Hyde Park in 50 years. Um, we are currently situated on the 11th floor of the new Harper Court Tower, which is on Lake Park and 53rd Street, kind of anchors the boulevard. In the next two years, there's going to be two large high-rise residential housing complexes anchored by Whole Foods on the first floor. So the traffic and the density is increasing. Um, you know, if, if I haven't convinced you yet that it, it is a hub for innovation, entrepreneurship, and creativity, then the fact that a Chipotle is in the space <laughs> probably will, right? I mean, do I need to say any more? I probably should have started with that and ended this whole conversation. But having a Chipotle there is certainly a catalyst for innovation. So with that, I'm going to close out and uh, take any questions that anyone has. I really appreciate your time and attention. I hope that I've got you to think about um, the innovation landscape in Chicago, where it's come from, where it's going, where you may fit in. And with that, I open up. First of all, thank you very much for your talk. Um, 
you're taking the, the Chicago Innovati Innovation Exchange seems to be taking a kind of systems design and engineering approach to the overall process of bringing things to market. As you, as you consider the components that go into that process and consider um, academic or quasi-academic uh, institutions, what do you think are the chief markers of the successful organizations or academic, quasi-academic institutions that can engage in the commercialization process, especially given the changes that have occurred even over the past few years uh, in the economy? Yeah, no, I think that, for example, for the University of Chicago or, or any large uh, global research institution, to be competitive in 20 years, you're going to have to become an engine for how you translate the ideas and technologies that were once basic research into ideas that get commercialized because we have to open up a new revenue line for those institutions to continue to maintain our eminence and be able to attract and retain the best faculty and students 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the road. So the engine, the, the, the research, there will be fewer of these larger research institutions and the ones that remain are going to be the ones that are effective at figuring out how to engineer and translate on a broader scale the ideas into commercial product opportunities. So you need this connection point and an understanding and, a, and an easy way for uh, industry to know where to come and what they're going to find when they get there, managing expectations, and innovators to know when they get there what they're going to find when they get there. And that recognizing, too, that we're in the early days. We're, we're building this, so it will take some time for us to see some successes that come out of that design process. But, you know, there are good examples of one-off type individuals that you could look to replicate. You know, you look at a, a Bob Langer or a, or a John Rogers, uh, you know, Chad Markin in, in nanotech, that they themselves have become kind of epicenters of how to translate, you know, research into applied technologies that the market wants to, to buy, a venture capitalist, an entrepreneur, a company that, you know, gone on to create, you know, a lot of prolific companies in that path. How can we do that on a more systemized, systematized basis within the innovation exchange? And then over time, you're attracting a new type of individual to uh, our institutions as well that are already hardwired for, for this type of thing. And I would argue that our next generation is hardwired. I mean, if we don't have a place like this collectively, then we risk the eminence of our collective enterprise in terms of the types of individuals that we're currently able to attract and retain. So almost like a Division I football program. You know, if you, if you bring in the four-star recruit to try to get them to sign up, you bring them into the locker room, you put the jersey on the back of the locker, you show them the expansive nature of the locker room, the weight room next door, where they're going to be practicing in the indoor facility, the weight room, and then where they're going to play on Saturday afternoons. And they sign up after they walk through, right? So the CIE is our answer for that when it comes to, you know, commercialization, translating ideas into the market and attracting the right people over time that will follow this process that we hope will yield better results and, 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 and impactful outcomes um, that at the end of the day. I mean, another analogy would be, I mean, the CIE is the APS in entrepreneurship uh, down, downtown. Uh, one thing I wanted to make sure that people realize, too, is that I now have a badge at Argonne. I come on Fridays. I have an office um, uh, near Greg Marin on the second floor of Building 201, starting to conduct office hours. Um, you know, we're trying to reach out to individuals that are interested in this process. So when I describe this, I hope it's been very clear that this means you, too, and, and we'll be here as much as we want you, you there in this process. Hopefully that's at least touched on what we're doing. Thanks for the great lecture. And I'm Yassine Merchmack. You've mentioned uh, gray hair and, and PhDs, and, 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 and that's great because we want to benefit from their experience and their expertise. But at the same time, those are, those are a category of people that could have some attachment to their environment and to their, you know, to their, over the years, they develop strings to the, to the, and the attachment. So was, is there any work that's been done at, at schools with, with young children uh, that don't have those attachments and, uh, and, and then we can foster innovation at that, at that stage, uh, starting from that stage? Yeah, well, I think, you know, I, I'll, answer my, I'll answer that question particularly as it 
you know, focuses around STEM. Um, you know, there are many different areas of innovation, but when we think about STEM and the educational process, I think there are efforts underway to really encourage, uh, you know, folks to, to follow the STEM pathway, and we know we have to work hard to do that. Um, I think that we're getting some early success in, you know, the, the awareness for our need to train our young individuals and educate them down a path where, you know, math and science are, are involved in that process. But I think equally important in that process is at the back end. So we're, we're starting to get results. We have people that are getting PhDs, they're getting their postdocs, but some of them can't find a job. So, I mean, we're telling everybody, go into STEM, we got to get, you know, math and science, that's where you got to concentrate. But we're not telling them about the fact that, you know, when they finish their degree, which is a remarkable Mount Everest experience in and of itself, there may not be a job for them. So I think we got to work on both ends of the tunnel. And I think where CIE is more concentrated on is the back end of the tunnel is as we get more people coming through STEM and are detached, as you pointed out, that are moldable and malleable earlier in their career. I do believe that it's most likely, like going back to my own experience, you know, I was fresh out of college. Mike had just gotten his postdoc, you know, worked for a year at Baxter. We really didn't have a lot to lose. And we thought we knew a lot of stuff. So to me, that's the profile of the person that you're looking for. It's someone early in their career that doesn't have a lot to lose, that is willing to take the risk, that's pushing. But they need to be tooled as well. But CIE being in the neighborhood will focus on, you know, programming for the neighborhood. You know, we want to have, we have relationships with, with Woodlawn and other charter schools so that they can be part of the programming as well. You know, being successful in our own neighborhood is also going to determine how successful we are with the CIE. So supporting STEM educational programs, particularly as a lab. I mean, being in the space, being exposed to what's going on as a student, I can immediately see how, why I should get a STEM degree would pay off in the marketplace. And there's no replacement for that. So that's where I think CIE will contribute most. John, two questions. As I understand, CIA is going to be an evergreen fund. Are you going to basically take equity in companies to, you know, to keep the fund going? Um, the typical vehicle that we invest in is twofold. Um, some of the projects we invest in are not an, in an entity yet. So in that case, it's a grant. Uh, in the case where an entity has been formed, uh, we invest, and in exchange, we get uh, convertible debt, which would convert in at the Series A round. So there would be equ an equity component in that. that that's what I figured. The, and the real question is, so you kind of describe three models. You know, where you come from, the pharma, which is a high-margin patent lockout, you know, activity to the market. Things like water and energy are capital-intensive but tend to be a lower-margin business. And then things like urban and data, which is a very fast-to-market and all but a lower capital. And they have very different pathways to market different skill sets. How are you going to define the three if you're going to basically cover, you know, the whole spectrum? Uh, good question. I think that we're, the way that we'll be smart in each of those spaces is by virtue of where we concentrate our, uh, our focus around stage. So there's a lot of commonality within each of those discrete sectors that have the same sets of challenges in year one, first year of life. So we're going to concentrate on you know, the fledgling entrepreneur in the first year of life, where the questions are similar across each of the sectors. And then set up within each of these sectors partnerships with you know, subject matter experts within those industries to be able to leverage talent that's already in the marketplace. So in computation, having partnerships like the one we have with Cisco would be an example. Developing one with a partner in water and energy is a goal we have as well, so that it's not so much we that are the experts in those areas, but we're, we're expert at being, uh, bringing the market in those core areas and people that make up those sectors to the innovators as it gets to subject matter differences that you've elucidated between a computation uh, type of uh, company ranging to a pharmaceutical type of company. First year of life, though, a lot of the same sets of challenges are there, and those are the companies that we're trying to support uh, across that range of industry. That's why we think we can still concentrate but be broad enough in those areas.
I've often heard that a, a, a significant step in the process is the development of a business plan. And I'm guessing from one of your slides that you'll help people develop those plans and bring them to the venture capitalists or the people that have the money. Yes, yeah. So when I talk about programming and workshops, it's building the business plan. And then it's bringing that business plan to life. And it's connecting that business plan to those who could invest in it. Yes. Do you have so, fond memories of your first business plans that you developed? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, our first business plan was, you know, we're going to, we, we started Medichem on an SBIR grant. It was a $50,000 grant to study an anti-cancer agent. And, uh, you know, $50,000, it, it took us long, you know, it took us further back then. But at some point in time, we knew we had to figure out uh, if we were going to make it, um, you got to find another source of revenue beyond that grant. So we started asking pharmaceutical companies, you know, could we do medicinal chemistry for you on a contract basis? And we built a business out of, you know, generating contracts, discovering others' molecules, generating cash, and then investing in our own molecules in that pathway. Now, I wish I could say that I had a master plan from day one that laid out exactly the pathway that I, you know, showed you happen. There were so many twists and turns in the process. I will say that my business plan always was to keep it as a hybrid, that you'd have this proprietary research arm uh, that would constantly be fed by the profits and, and support and the infrastructure that you were able to develop on the contract arm. And we learned uh, in 1999 that the businesses needed to be separated. Uh, and that was a big change for me to realize that there were investors that, on one hand, were really interested in the profits of the contract business, but had wanted no part in the other side of the business that was burning cash. But there was another set of investors that really liked the cash burn model because of the upside potential that it represented. In my master business plan, those businesses were always together. All right, let's thank John one more time for a great talk. <laughs>